good evening uh welcome to one of the most interesting fireside chats at uh, our asia pvc summit 2020 and i'm joined by alfred chong a uh, general partner at race capital since selling his company BA Systems to Oracle for $8.5 in the middle of the financial crisis, Alfred has kept a low public profile. Uh, but over the last decade, he has been quietly investing and has a portfolio of over 100 startups. Alfred is now back, made his uh, public return now with a new venture fund, uh, Race Capital. Um, Alfred, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I want to start with a big, some of the broader points. Let me start with something that's been on everybody's mind. Uh, tech after Trump, you know, what does Joe Biden's win mean uh, for Asia? Georgie, thank you very much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. And it's very good to be back. Um, and uh, this definitely is a hot topic here. Um, and obviously in the US, you know, it's um, not all said and done yet. You know, we're still um, doing the last minute counting and recounting and all that is going on. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, there's been a very challenging few years for us because um, uh, the US policy and so as I think uh, other uh, foreign policy has been pretty tough on many sectors of the business, especially around tech, because the whole issue about uh, information protection, consumer and personal identification and security issues and all the way to national security issues have been brought up by a lot of uh, nation's leader. And um, I do think that, um, uh, it, you know, the incoming president, um, president-elect Biden, will likely handle the situation quite differently, you know, because he has um, a very long history um, as a diplomat in dealing with foreign countries like China, right, for going back 20, 20 plus years. In fact, actually, I was reading up a, um, a um, old paper, an op-ed that um, uh, pre President-elect Biden had published on the New York Times on how the rising of China might not mean the demise of the US and other places. So I think many of his points, I agree with him. So I think we would likely see a much more balanced kind of approach to uh, intellectual property protection and many other things. Um, and more likely will have less of the deal uh, making type style of, of, of activities that's going on between um, you know, Asia, China, and the US going forward. Got it. Uh, but Alfred, just wanted to understand, uh, you know, you are based in the US and uh, one of the greatest hopes, I'm, I'm saying hopes that the tech industry has for Biden uh, is that he may reverse or at least slow down the deep coupling that, you know, that's that sort of sort of kicked off in the last maybe one or two years uh, in the U.S. and China, especially on the supply chain front. Now, how do you see it uh, from where you're based? Yeah, um, I, I want to be realistic because anytime that you have a trade war, and it's a natural place to start, basically, is on a supply chain, right? So you're starting to put very heavy import duties on items, and then you're starting to have the sectors, people in the business sector, starting to react to those kind of activities, and they started to decommit and also sometimes they move manufacturings and also uh, some of the components uh, manufacturing out of places where, you know, just to be able to adjust to the scenario, they hatch on the text. So those things typically takes a while for it to reverse costs completely, even if the policy is to say they're not going to do any more of those type of, you know, a trade war type activities. So I want to be realistic. This is not going to be, it's going to take a while to unwind some of those things, but, but I think, people will feel a whole lot better based on um, maybe just the approach or maybe the, maybe the way that they will explain how things will get done. The language they be using to converse around these subjects will likely change and will provide people's confidence that is maybe moving back to that direction. So, so I think this is gonna need some patience. So it's gonna take a little while for it to go back to what we think it should be, yeah. Just a related question. Uh, one of the common complaints that, and it's a very broad question that people have been talking about is, is the whole uh, reciprocal uh, this in the sense that uh, a lot of US tech companies or the Western com tech companies are not allowed in China. Yeah. Uh, now, and that's that's been going on for a lot of years. On, on, the one, on, on the other hand, you have a lot of Chinese companies trying to go global. And how do you see that debate sort of shaping up uh, under Biden? Because uh, most people don't expect many of the US or the Western tech companies to be allowed in China anytime soon. So actually, when the whole uh, TikTok subject was um, uh, very heated, you know, it's not it's not over yet. 
uh, in the US. I have made a bunch of commentary on, the, um, on public televisions and other places. My belief is the following. I think it's extremely important for us to think like this. So if, you know, we all know why, for example, China has a great firewall. They don't let information coming in and out. And I think we can judge whether that is right or wrong because it's their way. So we have to accept that China will have their way and they've been very successful in their way. It's just different, right? But for any of the Western world, especially the US, which is the founding principle of the internet is to be open. And we create a firewall of our own to block you know, um, the Chinese from coming in the same vein, that would be terribly wrong. So you, you would think, well, you know, they do it, why not? Why can't we do it, right? But it's not how it should be because that is not our way either. This is not the American way. So the American way will be have very wide open internet access, total freedom of information. So if we stand on that principle on its own, then we should never put up a firewall and block the Chinese technology from coming. And I think it should be on the merit so if these technology are not well accepted here as it cannot proliferate here, it's on its own reasons, one thing. But I think the block it would be terribly wrong. That would set horrible you know, examples for how things should work, roll forward for American technology companies on policy. Got it. Let me just move to something that, you know, because uh, we uh, at Deal Asia, we, we headquartered in Singapore and something that, you know, uh, to ask you on a broader perspective of what we're seeing play out in this region. We're seeing a lot of these American tech companies uh, be it the, uh, be it Google, Amazon, Apple, Stripe, Twitter, Netflix, all of these large US tech companies becoming increasingly active in markets like you know, Southeast Asia, especially markets like Indonesia, which has got a pretty large population. Um, they've been sort of competing with some of the Chinese tech giants for many of the deals, uh, deals here. Just in the last couple of weeks, you know, um, Google has invested in one of Indonesia's largest uh, e-commerce companies, uh, Tokopedia, you know, WhatsApp is there on, uh, Google is also there on the, uh, Indonesia's largest ride-hailing platform, which is Gojek, it's on their cap table. Uh, WhatsApp is on, uh, has been investing on, in, has invested in Gojek recently. Microsoft did invest in another uh, e-commerce company in Indonesia, Bukalapak recently. And we saw the same thing playing out in China, with, uh, sorry, in India over the last two years, where American uh, strategics were been increasingly getting competitive uh, compared to sort of uh, the Chinese strategy. What? How do you, you know, what, why, why is this happening? Do the American strategic see these as core markets that they need to be in outside their countries? And why the enhanced activity? What do you think is behind it? Well, I think it's only uh, logical as market become mature, right? So you can only take on so much market share before the regulators start calling on you. So which they have, right? And then you will have to expand in other markets where the regulator hasn't called on you yet. So, yeah. and plus, you know, you, we still have, we still like high um, revenue and earning growth, right? So in order to do that, when you have exploited the market a lot, you either put new products out into those existing markets. So your channel can sell those other products or you have to go to other market. But, and I think it, it's just a matter of time that Southeast Asia and, and also India will become such big, I am totally not surprised of the activity that's going on um, in these incredible countries because um, first of all, it has very large population Two, the adoption of internet access have bypassed, you know, basically 20 years worth of legacy that the rest of the Western world have experienced, right? which is basically through um, the use of a laptop or a desktop computer using, you know, uh, a browser to get access to this type of stuff. They don't, right? So all they need is a very inexpensive uh, mobile handset and that they will be able to have the same kind of enjoyment and access, especially now we can see 5G coming in with 50 megabit per second onto these devices and soon very inexpensive 50 megabyte, 50 megabit per second devices. So this will open up a door in like every type of commerce applications, information access, information sharing. So those markets are gonna be super crucial, especially when you're not hindered with any legacy technology, basically it's immediately adopted instant gratification. And the easiest way to get into this market is not to fight the locals. Right, so you you give something back to the local. So partnership and investment in the local kind of e-commerce um, uprising company is super critical because that will be the way to get in. So now, what will happen downstream? Whether they'll be acquired by the giants or not, or the giants will then squeeze their way into those market and they compete with them, it's it's we, we can see history, right? That at, at times will happen. You know, at, at the end, two things happen. One is, you know, if, if this continue to benefit the end user and the consumers. 
then I think they will continue to grow in this pace. If at some point in time, this is just about price hike, then the regulators will ultimately stop them. So we've seen it in telecoms, we've seen it in petroleum, we've seen it in every other industry before. It will just take time and that will happen. So I'm pretty confident a fair game eventually will get figured out, but, but in these markets is super, super hard. But you're also not mentioning, we also now have a lot of skills that are being developed in places like Vietnam for like Dainan as a hub center, center for doing software development, you know, let alone, you know, you know, Singapore and these key big countries. So we're going to see in Malaysia and other places where it's not going to be just consuming this stuff. They also will be making and developing and will be just, it's just over time, the software eating the world will continue to be eating it away. I mean, we're going to see software utilization and also development everywhere. So I think that's pretty much where we're heading to, which is great. Yeah. You talked about software eating the world. It's, it's interesting because many of these countries, like for example, if you take Indonesia, they skipped the, the landline phone revolution. They've skipped the laptop revolution. They, they, they skipped the PC, the PC part. They skipped the banking, you know, going to a physical bank. They skipped the, re, you know, and then they've skipped the evolution of malls in the rest of the world. Uh, uh, they've gone to e-commerce directly. It's all because, all because of software and the handset and the smartphone that they have. Uh, in that context, I just wanted to understand from you, like as many of these US strategies become dominant players in, in uh, Asian countries outside China, uh, you spoke about the regulators having caught up in many of these countries. We are starting to see the backlash, like for example, Google is facing in India because uh, it, it, it's a dominant player across all spaces. Uh, if you look at Facebook or Southeast Asia, most people think the internet is just Facebook alone. Um, therefore, how do you see this uh, shape up? Because uh, the local ecosystems, the local investors uh, feel that they can't, the local companies can't compete against many of these US giants. So, so, so I, think, I think here's the way that you know, we will have, really have to think of it. So you never want to compete with giants at the same level uh, of the technology that they have, right? So if, if Facebook is a platform for social networking, it's a platform, then you don't want to go reinvent that wheel because that would just take forever to rack up that kind of install base and all the functionality being tested and used and tried and connected by so many people. However, things that either plug on top or on the side or reinvention of those technology is super critical. This is the thing that I always have to remind people of. It's very, actually very interesting. So the, one of the very key reasons why I can't leave, I mean, especially as I try to go low profile and try to do my own thing, eventually I resurface is because it's just too exciting. The technology field is so exciting that what industry can you get into that you can see your legacy come legacy go and then recreating your own legacy and see it go again and come again in your own lifetime, multiple times, right? This really technology field is the only field that could be happening. So, so that means I think we have to have confidence. You know, what we think of how dominant Google is, how dominant Facebook may be, how dominant Amazon may be. I'm pretty sure in our lifetime, we'll see new dominant players that we ended up either um, replacing them or maybe they're far ahead of them. Because, you know, the, you know like just like 10 years ago in the last financial crisis, almost none of these names existed, right? Facebook didn't exist. So what did we have back then? We have a bunch of other things we were using, right? We're using instant messaging, you know, big names in tech were IBM, Intel, HP, right? And a lot of those companies are either split up or they're gone and they're no longer the hot company. So that can happen. I think I'm pretty sure that we're going to see that again. So tech is terribly exciting because, you know, we haven't seen that one company from India or maybe from Singapore that's going to be a next world giant that we haven't experienced it yet. But I'm going to bet it's going to ex we're going to experience it in our lifetime. Interesting. There's one company from Singapore. I don't know if you have noticed. It's called C, uh, the e-commerce company Garina. They have a gaming division which is the world's most, the best performing stock, better than anything else. And their valuations is like um, skyrocketed because of the potential that this region offers for e-commerce. But I just wanted to come back to another tech point that you mentioned when you said that we could see new dominant companies coming up. Um, do you think the next stage of, uh, of the tech would be unbundling of some of these big companies? Because today I go to somebody like, for example, Google for email, I, I share my photos, I do, all sorts of things. I, I go for storage. I go for a whole lot of things. Somebody can come and say, okay, I'm, go, I'm, I'm going to be doing only email, but I'll do email best. I'll do email faster. Or somebody can, you know, say, un, so uh, because all of these tech giants offer like um, 
uh, what there could be vertical uh, e-commerce companies who come up and do maybe offer only uh, pet food or baby diapers way better than amazon can do or something or maybe sports goods so is do you see and the opportunity to sort of even though there are tech giants like you said you can't build or compete directly with facebook but take one division of some of the what these companies are and do that way better than some of these tech giants can do so so george you having two things right so one is any time when you have a tech company get big remember our industry requires constant reinvention yeah nobody can stay in the same place and expect just keep getting big that's just really not quite possible right and and i don't think we're going to see that in any industry let alone a tech industry so i think from that perspective likelihood is somebody's going to invent something totally new right what is doing email but it might not be in the form of what we think of as email today but it will totally replace email period right email is very old right so 30 40 years so in popular form that people are using it in place of snail mail and writing it on a piece of letter so i think that was for sure would be happening The other thing is, I want to give a very simple example. So right now we're having this um, um, show basically over Zoom, and we we uh, we can record it and we can replay it. But Zoom is our uh, one software, one application that we use for doing this communication. I'm pretty sure in a decade, every application will have a Zoom in there. So collaboration will be offered as a service, will be embedded fully, make available to the developers. to build into every application because that's really what we need. So if that's the case, imagine the opportunity in every single field inside the collaboration field what is whiteboarding, what is messaging. So existing player obviously can get in that field, but also new player and completely dominate those field that people are using a basically a full stack vertically driven kind of application and they won't be using it anymore. That's entirely can happen. That's in history of tech, that's really what happens. I'm bundling and then you have new invention new tech new vertical and then and then you whole, take a whole new shape when we look back and say how did we even get here how do you even is possible right interesting i mean assume assume is not alone is a miracle yeah. it's 350 million plus monthly active users that came out of nowhere literally right yeah. because of the pandemic so anything can happen yeah and also an example of how people across uh, the youngsters the older generation everybody who nobody who's done a video calling before has in no such a quick time got comfortable using zoom and that is something that we thought could never happen yeah i just want to shift gears you know uh, we don't have much time i want to shift gears to go back to uh, come back to race capital um uh, who want to raise about 125 to 150 million i just want to understand where are you so far both in terms of raising capital in terms of deployment or also in sort of you know sectors geographies uh, what's the the concept the thesis for race capital so actually um to talk about race capital I have to talk about some of the genesis of why uh we really want to do this and um i have to mention my um i call him my boss my mentor a guy called bill jane way jane way uh at the time was the principal and he led the uh tech venture group at wolf thinkers so he gave me and my two co-founders at BEA 50 million dollars and that ended up returning 6.5 billion dollars to the um limited partner of Warby Pinkers that story got so stuck in my mind and and because bill has such been genuinely has been such an incredible mentor all this time so this fund we have to think of it this way right so we we i mean we're very lucky despite um we have a pandemic the public equity market has traded extraordinarily strong we we basically are hitting all time high so that also opened up the wallet for people to invest into private funds and especially in tech so our fundraising has been doing very well and and what i really wanted to do is to be able to invest in the companies help those um companies to be really, really, very very successful so um you know our investments are really divided into two types which is formation type companies and also seed type companies formation companies are basically entrepreneurs that we have been tracking we've been talking to we form a company with them this is not incubation this is extremely high touch helping them all the way through you know product market fit and making those companies successful not just with money but with our effort so as raise capital our goal you know which is not just raising the capital but also deploying in the decent way we've done about eight deals and so far these are sensational deals i mean like i i can't be happier with what we have accomplished so far and any sectors geographies that you look at 
for or raise capital and because you said you just did a deal so yeah. which what's the spread yeah so it's actually very interesting so obviously um all almost all the gps are based here um in the silicon valley but this is the phenomenon of covid phenomenon of covid has caused all the company to go decentralized so it really doesn't matter what you where you are anymore right now i i have never been a big believer that you have a bunch of remote sites as an early stage company but it completely changed me because now if everybody is working remotely which is really the case right and there's no end in sight when any tech worker is going to go back to work if you're creating a company from scratch that fully decentralized having someone in singapore someone in hong kong someone in london and someone in budapest and someone in san francisco if they can figure out how to really manage the company culturally and procedurally it can do magic so i don't think it matters so we actually have um a company that we have invested is a, the guys based in china uh you know and uh we have a couple of companies that i'm tracking that we are about to make investment that are like in, you know very successful entrepreneur that's based in hong kong and has recently actually moved the entire company to london right like this like one meeting one week i'm talking to them in hong kong next week whole company uprooted unplugged and they went to london and that's how magical this is and it doesn't do any difference for me except my call with him change from the morning to the evening that's it or evening yeah. actually to the morning that, i mean that we really cannot take it for granted that's this is a magical moment for really genuine globalization of technology creation it really is got it so you talked about uh, you just talked about the decentralized workplaces so in that to that extent you know geography becomes irrelevant uh, going forward now how do you see that sort of impacting both uh, you and you spoke about how you have done uh, deals like somebody is based in hong kong moved to china sorry moved to london um, and so how do you see that impacting the entrepreneurial ecosystems globally because if you look at it you know there have been few large ecosystems you have the valley uh, you have uh, places like singapore you have hubs like vietnam couple of hubs in china there's bangalore in uh, india the fund managers are also largely around these ecosystems so now do you actually see a scenario where the 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 pe firms the vc firms will sort of start looking at uh, you know and many of these funds are also have a geographical mandate some people do let's say some funds to singapore some to indonesia some to india but do you see that changing to say fund manager saying i have a i have a global mandate going forward it doesn't matter where or which company i invest in and um, george i actually believe that um the fund business will take a much slower um mutation to these kind of mandates than the company would so and and by the way that's actually is the right order if the company should move faster so for example you know maybe your mandate is to invest in a company a tech company that really only can be in the east coast and the west coast of the united states but what happened if half the workers now that they're hiring really qualified workers are happen to be in you know like in singapore they're not going to stop investing in them right so i'm looking at this and I say well they literally are pulling fun and the mandate into the globalized direction and i totally see this is the way that this this trend is going to be moving you you mean you're sitting in front of zoom and you're meeting with someone most of the people don't even ask where exactly are you what time zone are you in and you can't tell so why does that matter then right in that case if 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 they are inventing the most well you know breaking technology you of course you will go for it so i think this just gives the opportunity such a bigger you know stands that there are so much more people can invest and can make the evolution of the technology and the way we needed to so much quicker which i think is reflected in the world the world wants from public equity market down to private to do exactly that right give us more technology move technological innovation even faster because we needed it very badly so 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 george you look back right so can you imagine what has been invented since the last financial crisis cloud software as a service um social network the touch phone the whole app economy the whole gig economy how will we have survived in this pandemic if we miss any of those so can you imagine the next one and now we didn't actually we in the pandemic we understand how critical they are how much innovation we need you know why would we put barry into locations when it doesn't really matter anymore so it will be not smart if you if you put that kind of barry in in front of yourself so i think those mandate will change just because the company are going to, to go into that direction yeah very interesting that you mentioned about what has changed from the last uh, crisis the financial crisis that we had to what uh, what's happening now 
uh, you actually sold uh, B uh, BEA systems uh, during the last uh, during the last financial crisis. How different is the current crisis? Is it far more severe than what we had in 2008 to 2010? Well. This is actually very different, right? So obviously this is a health crisis. Last time it was a complete meltdown on our banking system that could have bankrupted the world. So in 2008, it's actually much more difficult financially for raising money, right? For people to listen to create very good ideas. In fact, almost from 2008 to 2011, we all we saw was just consolidation in enterprise software. So most of the innovation was consumer software, right? So most of the consumer company that we are so accustomed to uh, using and experiencing today all came from that error. So I think actually this crisis, we didn't create any kind of liquidity issue, nor fundraising problem for any, for any companies. So that actually is marvelous, right? So money kept raising. In fact, the prices is getting higher every single day. So it's actually in the, it's in the opposite trend. Now, go to market would be vastly different because now we really have to think through, you know, like the physical channels are basically, you can't count on it anymore. So how do you deliver everything through a, you know, a online kind of channel? It's, a, it's an interesting one, right? So how do you get your customer to adopt your technology even faster when they could be bringing a mortar that even though they, ne they needed to, you know, to change, but they change slowly. Got it. So crises also create some of the most impactful, you know, transformation ideas that we've seen. The past crises have created it. In that sense, is this the best time for entrepreneurs to go out there, start up? Is it the best time for investors to be hunting for some of the most innovative companies that they may see or would you sort of take a cautious wait and watch approach? I think we have never seen a better time to go do a new technology company than present ever in history. There's never been a moment that's better than what we see now. There's never been the need, the declaration of the desire to adopt technology like we have ever seen. We have never ever seen it. So um, if we think the dot-com prices were big, and then the type of technology that we have seen, technology company we've seen emerge from the dot-com crisis since the dot-com crisis. And then the financial crisis has the list of those company, the types of company that I was talking about. This one will be multiple times bigger than those two crises combined. So I think it'd be foolish for us if we really have a good, great technological idea not to pursue it. That, that, I, that, this is the best ever timing, basically we have ever seen in mankind. It will be a crime not to not 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 to pursue it. it really is. Yeah, uh, Alfred, uh, we have a couple of minutes. I just want to step back quickly and ask you one more thing. Uh, because you over the last decade have quietly invested in about hundred startups, if I'm not mistaken. What's your portfolio like? And you know what are the lessons that you've learned from angel? Because hundred is not a small number. What are the lessons that you have learned by being an angel investor? Yeah. Um, so number one thing that I learned, which I applied it, you know, every single day in running the venture businesses. Um, angel investing is all about the people. It's making that emotional connection. And I have a very simple rule. If I don't feel so passionate after the person pitching me the first time, there will be no second meeting. If I get so passionate about it, that by the time I get through the first meeting, the second meeting, the third meeting, I want to co-found the company with the entrepreneur I see, that's the right investment. Because when you have the right person, that technological business is going to need a lot of exercising we're going to go through a lot of gyration. We're going to pivot left, pivot right. We're going to be making a lot of adjustment as we go to market. Those are all really acceptable risks that when you invest in this early stage of a technology company, that's just part of the game. But we have the right people. My God, they will get through all of it. And, and they will surprise you at the end. Look at Slack. Slack started as a gaming platform company. They ended up with the, and become the world's most dominating, you know, messaging company for, for workers of all kinds. And, and it's just, those are the kind of thing that inspire, you know, people to say, wow, you know, if you have the right people and you have the right leadership, they can do magical thing. Jan Stocker, um, Ali Goshi from Databricks. And in the you know, like even when the days that they were um, technologists in a university, in an academic environment, you could just tell their passion and their ability to create incredible things to change the world in big data. Those are, I think, the most critical thing. And, right. and uh, I feel strongly that angel investing and this actually absolutely are the same, you know, that you have to pick the right people. Got it. Slack is now under attack by Microsoft Teams. But that's a different uh, issue altogether. But, but 
uh, venture investing is very different from angel investing because capital has always be, al- almost become like a commodity. There's so many venture firms chasing uh, a set of companies and and there's only a certain number of good companies for all of these firms to chase. So what more can you bring to the table as a venture investor other than capital? Because because there are there are hundreds of firms that have the capital to deploy in all of these companies. So uh, why should a company come to you or choose you over maybe 10 to 20 other VC firms? Well, I tell you, I, I, this is the way I look at it. If it, it's an entrepreneur who doesn't want me to be co-founder, they shouldn't be coming in our direction. So the reason why they want us is they want me and my other partners in the firm to be helping them and working with them on a daily basis. And we really do. I mean, in the formation company, generally three times a week, I'll be on a Zoom call with them. Three times, not once. So to a point where they can't even tell, I actually are doing other things. Of course I am, right? I mean, I mean, like, I, I don't know what to do my, with myself. I don't have the 12 hours of work that get put in through Zoom and working on various things all day long. But that's the most crucial thing. We help them on not just idealization, but we work with them on the technological involvement, work on them on the go-to-market. I use my Rolodex to get them into the first proof of concept. We help them on fundraising. We, you know, we partner with the right people so that the cap table have the right people on it. So all of that are super, super critical. And by the way, the biggest difference between the angel investing and doing the fund is portfolio construction, right? So because at the end of the day, we have other people that invested alongside with our general partners in our fund. So we have to stay true to the way that we're going to go about investing in that money. So investing in the formation, investing in the seed, and the way that we go by investing them, we're picking the company. What's the percentage of ownership that we have to get through that threshold? This is super critical. You don't care about that stuff that much in angel investing, but in running a fund, you have to, because that's the the only way that we have things to show for, to show how good we really are and how disciplined we are, right? Because they're entrusting us with our money. So that, that part is crucial. But, but the people pick us, they don't pick us for money. They pick us because we can put forth those kind of assistance to them. And this is not incubation. They feel like we're co-founding and running the company with them in the earlier stage, which is the hardest stage of the company. If they get through that, they get through C, they can get to A. Maybe they can go on their own. But my expectation, I'm going to stay with these companies for a long time. Got it. So what's your experience been? And this is almost my final question. What's your experience been in terms of deal making during the pandemic? How do you scan opportunities? How do you conclude deals because you can't travel? Do you, can you gauge people enough over Zoom, uh, due diligence? Because at early stage, it's, it's more about understanding people. It's not, you don't have much of a business case to evaluate the companies. You don't see cash flows. You don't see bank statements. Uh, how's, you know, how's, how's deal making evolved over the last six months? So first of all, I think it would be foolish for any investors not to accept we will be investing through Zoom because this is going to be the way that we're going to be for a long while, as we have discussed before we started the session, that it could be quite some time. It could be a year or two, or maybe even longer before we go back to total normalcy. And during this time, you know, speed is everything in investing because, you know, obviously prices like tide is rising, right? If, if, the, if the deal is super strong and, and they're seeing results and it, because they can make, they can show results that, you know, progressive result every single week, right? Those are the best companies. Well, those kind of companies, if you don't race to it, literally, that's the reason why we have this name, then you're going to miss those deals. So being able to have like, like me and my partners, we've seen over 370 companies since the pandemic started. So you have to be relentless. And the other thing is when you meet somebody that's good, you don't wait a few weeks. You get on it right away, right? After a couple of days, you do enough research, you get back on it. You distill it down, you narrow it down to a point where you can get conviction. Again, it's a little harder, there's no doubt, right? Because you're not really making true eye contact, but then you have to, you know, best use this tool. And I, I have to be serious, Georgie. I said, this is the first time I met you, but I think the next time I see you, it's like seeing old friends. We have to accept that this is going to be the way. And the first time I'm going to see you in person in Singapore, I'm sure I'm going to give you a hug because this is just going to be the way how the world is going to be, right? We have to accept friendship and socialization is going to be changing in a, from a different angle. So we have to trust the tools. If we don't trust the tools and we don't move fast enough, we're not going to be able to do these deals. Yep. I think we all can do with a hug. So my final question is, uh, you are originally from Hong Kong. Uh, and I think that city needs a hug more than like, you know, how do you see the future of that city going forward? 
Do you feel sad? I, I, Do you feel like? I, I absolutely see bright future for Hong Kong. I know that we um, Hong Kong has gone through some tremendous turmoil. I was there last year and I saw a lot of it. Um, and um, I think it's just it's a, it's a, it's it's going through growing pain, right? It's a going through a transition that is now halfway through the fifty years time limit um, of merging with China, and um, you know we have to look at the upside of what China can bring to the table to Hong Kong also. So I see um, a very very bright bright future for Hong Kong. Just look at the tax scene in China, right? Today it doesn't exist in Hong Kong. Just imagine if Hong Kong can improve. Let's say a hundred percent in terms of its deal flow, a hundred percent in company, you know, forming, hundred percent more company get funded in various stages. It's going to be a whole different place. And these are very, very flexible people. They, you know, Hong Kong has more hustler than I've ever seen anywhere in all aspects. So I have truly very high hope, and also, um, uh, you know, I, I think Hong Kong is going to going to do great things in the future. I really do. We have to be low patient. This is a transition time. And then once we get through the transition, I think we're gonna see things differently. Yeah, it's, it's among my favorite cities too. Uh, Alfred, yeah. I think we've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your insights. That's like a very engaging session, especially for our audience in Asia. Uh, lovely to have you. And we hope to see you sometime in person, uh, either in Singapore or Hong Kong very soon. And Georgia, it's my pleasure. And it's great seeing all of my friends in Asia. I can't wait. That I can go back to travel and see you, all of you in person. So we'll look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.